Howdy folks, today we're probably going to go through the most difficult topic matter that we're going to be going through in general with the class, and that is now we're looking at rotation. So we're going to take all that linear physics we did before, all that straight line stuff, and now we're going to look at rotation about an axis. So when we're talking about angular motion, we're just talking about how something rotates, how it spins on an axis, how we naturally going to swing or twist something through a certain number of degrees. We're not doing this in radians, we're doing this in degrees in this course in a certain period of time. Degrees over time, we're talking rotational velocity. Changes in rotational velocities, acceleration, same basic concept, only now we are literally put a twist on it. So the example that's really easy to think about is think about someone just doing a little putt in golf compared to someone doing a drive where they're going to be moving a much greater number of degrees and that change of degrees over time, the velocity, is going to be much greater when they're driving the golf ball as opposed to when they're putting it. Now, torque is the rotational force about an axis. So before we had force where we're just gonna be pushing into another object. Now torque is that force that we're producing along that axis that's going to give us effectively the product of the force multiplied by the moment arm, or essentially the length of the lever we're applying the force to. Okay? And that's gonna be equal to the shortest perpendicular distance between a force line of action and its axis of rotation. That sounds kind of weird. Now when we say perpendicular line, which is if I'm rotating my elbow, it's going to be where I'm pushing straight in. So if I push in an angle here, in reality, it's a vertical force right there. Now you can think of torque as in if we're turning a wrench. Now the longer the wrench handle, if we can apply the same amount of force each time, we're going to create a greater torque when we have a longer arm to go ahead and rotate on. And when you think about that perpendicular line of force, so same thing if I'm pushing this upward angle, it's still the point at which I'm pushing in. So we still need to think about vectors, keeping things simple and looking at the point which is applied perpendicularly. Now, the reason we care about this is because it turns out this is how we really move our body. So the example of somebody holding an object in their hand, their bicep is contracting to lift that entire forearm along with their hand and the weight of the object. And the bicep attaches really close to that fulcrum, that point of rotation, so it has a really bad mechanical advantage for that force arm compared to the force arm for the weight of your forearm, which can be you know, somewhere around the midpoint, probably a little higher up since forearms are pretty dense. The midpoint of the weight of your hand, how far that's away, and then the midpoint of the center of the object you're holding in your hand and how far that is away from the elbow. So we're going to have torques that are both lifting an object and pulling it down. So we're just looking for the sum of these forces. And whenever they happen to be all equal, that's what's known as equilibrium. So that's where the amount of force that's being pushing us down is the same amount that's pushing us up. Now we need to talk about levers, okay? We've got a variety of levers. The first lever we have is a first class lever. That, think of an old school seesaw, where the fulcrum is always gonna be in between the two points that we're lifting, okay? We then are gonna have a second class lever, which think of a wheelbarrow where we're gonna hold it on the end, we're gonna have the weight in the middle, and then we're gonna be picking it up on the side. So it actually makes the object lighter to lift. And then finally, which is most of how the body works, a third class lever, where we're gonna have the fulcrum on the end, the weight, that the resistance on the far side, and then we're gonna be lifting in between the two. So think about pulling back on a fishing pole, where you are applying that force lifting up, the resistance is the far end, and then your other arm is effectively working as the fulcrum. So, Lever is simply a rigid bar that allows us to rotate about a fixed point. Pretty simple. We are gonna be using it to balance forces, so we're gonna be holding things in the same position. So when I'm holding my arm out to the side, the fulcrum happens to be in my shoulder. The rigid bar is my arm, okay? The force arm lifting me up is going to be my deltoid attaching here, lifting vertically, but it's actually pulling at an angle. That's why we have to think about perpendicular force. And then the resistance is the midpoint of the weight of my upper arm, the midpoint of the weight of my forearm, and the midpoint of the weight of my hand. Sorry, really long arms, so I gotta move all over the place to make this work. And whenever we have a greater amount of torque lifting as opposed to bring us down, it's gonna lift us up. When we have a lower amount of torque lifting us up and pulling us down, we're gonna go downwards. And the bigger the discrepancy, the faster we're gonna go ahead and move. So, we have a lever, we have a fulcrum, we have a place where we are applying our effort, and then we have a place where we have resistance being applied. So this is occurring throughout the body. Every single bone effectively is a lever, except for your hyoid, which just kind of floats there. And 
your uh, patella, which actually helps increase leverage on your knee to increase performance. Now, what's producing force to help overcome all these resistances? That's our muscles. And notice it doesn't always resemble a perfect bar. There's a lot of different things going on, and that's where this can get to be really tricky, so you have to think about it, okay? Now, the antagonist muscle is the one doing the lifting. The antagonist is the one resisting that muscle working. And now, fascia is gonna be connective tissue. If you guys have questions about that, just try and lean all the way down and lick your shin with your legs straight in front of you. Um, some of you guys might be flexible enough to do it. A lot of you guys aren't, and that's because of both muscular limitations and fascial limitations. So, anytime we have a balance between our resistance and our force production, we are going to have this simple formula that we're gonna be looking at. So, which is our effort times our effort arm is it going to equal our resistance times our resistance arm. Effort being the muscle doing the lifting. You'll sometimes see force and force arm, same thing as part doing lifting. Resistance is going to be the load that's pulling us down and the resistance arm is the length of the lever. So, what we're going to find is when we have a larger effort arm, we are going to have a better mechanical advantage when it's shorter, less so, and so on and so forth. Now, one thing when we look at this figure, we have to also understand that not only are we gonna have to lift the perpendicular resistance arm of the load we're lifting, but we're also going to go ahead and have the resistance arm of the fulcrum itself, aka the forearm and the hand. All of those are gonna be adding up together, which will be important when you guys are doing your projects. So once again, first class lever, think seesaw. A great example where we find this is literally on our head, where our spinal erectors are keeping the fulcrum point from letting our head droop since most of the weight of our skull is obviously to the front of the body. Other examples we're gonna have here is going to be actually in the triceps because the triceps attached to the electron process. We then have the elbow joint just slightly in front of that and then obviously we're resisting everything on the arm on the other side. Now, these are pretty simple to work through. Take your time and understand that it turns out if your fulcrum is in the middle, then you have a pretty balance between force on each side. If you wanna be better at force production, you wanna have that fulcrum really close to the weight you're trying to lift, and then you're pull, lifting from the other side. So think about using a shovel, where you put that in the ground, the fulcrum is the edge of the shovel blade, and it's lifting all the dirt up, which just allows you to lean on the handle and not have to produce as much force. But the way it's mostly for our bodies, it's favoring the speed and range of motion, which is where we're gonna find the fulcrum is way closer to where we're gonna apply the effort, like the triceps. So think about if the triceps only have to straighten a little bit, so think about how little distance this electron process moves in order to let my arm move through that big of a range of motion. So, and like anything else, we apply more force on one side, the other side is going to tip in that direction. Second class lever, wheelbarrow and your gastroc and soleus lifting you when you're doing a calf raise. So the ball of your foot is the fulcrum, the resistance is your body going through your ankle, body weight going through your ankle, and then your effort lifting you up is going to be through your calcaneus tendon, Achilles heel, that is gonna be lifting us up through the support of our gastroc and our soleus. This is really good because it's always gonna magnify your force production. That's why you can have relatively tiny calves but still have very strong calves. Because your effort arm is always gonna be longer than your resistance arm. Unfortunately, we live in a world where most of our body only moves through third class. This is great because it allows us to move through a large range of motion with not having to have muscles shorten that far. So it allows for speed, but it has a sacrifice for force production. Now, where are we producing torque? Well, we're producing torque around any joint where we're having rotation. And remember, we're gonna add the weight of the load, the weight of that part of the body in its center of mass to the resistance side. The effort is gonna be the muscles lifting us. So once again, our effort times our effort arm equals our resistance times our resistance arm. So if we wanna be lifting an object, our effort times effort arm has to be a higher sum than the resistance on the resistance arm. And then if we wanna be lowering, the opposite needs to be true. So here we have an example of being in equilibrium. We apply more force than the resistance on the other side. We're going to tip the force side down and lift the resistance side up. Now, we then have rotational force. And this can be force that's not in the straight object line of center of gravity. So if I'm trying to push another person, if I push them through the center of mass, they're gonna, in theory, 
if I can apply enough force, they're going to slide back as I apply the force there. But if I just push them, say they're standing facing me and I'm just pushing their shoulder, I'm now creating an eccentric rotary force because it's trying to rotate them about that axis. And if we apply enough of that force, we're going to get that object to rotate. So you can think about when you're picking up something off the ground and kind of tipping on its side, when we're throwing a spiral with a football, when you're doing some weird type of tug of war balance game with another person, because I mean, that's kind of cool, I guess. But we're always going to be looking at the sum of all these torques going about any of these joints, which is it's that sum of all the torques that's going to be pulling us down and lifting us up. That's going to give us the general effect on where we're going to be at. So if we have the greater on one side than other, that's what we're going to be moving through. Another thing to keep in mind is force coupling, which is whenever we have parallel forces that are going to be working in opposite directions, but they're all pulling around different points of the axis. So a great one is the core, the internal and external obliques. So when you fire your internal oblique on your right side and your external oblique on your left, on your opposite side, you're going to rotate to the direction of whatever excuse me, internal oblique you're firing. And the same is gonna be true with your scapula. So when we talk about upwards rotation of the scapula, which you can see the picture in the center, and the effects of the lower trap, the upper trap, and the serratus anterior, all three of those firing is actually gonna cause the scapula to rotate upwards. Now, remember, the resultant torque, so when you add everything together, it's gonna to have to always be equal to the individuals. And remember, any time that we happen to have a greater number on one side of the other, we're going to have rotation. Now, mathematically, it's considered to be a positive torque if we're going to be going and moving ourselves counterclockwise. It's going to be a positive torque if we're going to go clockwise. That's not going to really come up in the class. The key is instead, I'm going to be focusing on you guys working on balance situations. So here's a mathematical way to see the individual breakdowns. Now, notice, remember, force is always going to be equal to mass times acceleration, so it's going to be in newtons. Our lever arm is going to be in meters. Now, that means when we have things like our arm, which unless you've got orangutan arms like I do, you're going to always get these numbers in centimeters. So you're just going to have to convert, but you're going to be able to figure out what is going to be our total newton meters. So if that is the units of torque, it happens to be pushing us in one direction or the other. So work your way through the slide, and then use some of the examples online to make sure that you're understanding how all this works together. So what's gonna be fascinating is the longer the lever we have, the greater total velocity we're going to have occurring at that point at the end of the lever arm. So even though my arm is only rotating at 10 degrees per second, actually it's faster than that, but if I lengthen my arm, now my hand looks like it's moving pretty quickly simply because it's a much longer lever arm. And if I was holding a ruler, that ruler, if we looked at the velocity at the end that it's going, especially if we release something like maybe a ball we're throwing, we're going to see that it's going to go and fly much faster. And that's why typically your throwing athletes, there's an advantage to having longer limbs. And what we're going to find is the greater that lever arm, that's going to also going to give us more resistance for spinning. So if we want to spin faster, we're actually going to pull our limbs inwards because now we're not going to have as long of levers that have to go ahead and extend out. And that's going to have an inertial effect that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So we're going to use the levers that make the greatest amount of sense for what we're doing. If our goal is to be fast, we really want to pick our short levers so that way we can go and move pretty quickly. Now, if we want to go ahead and have strength, we want to have our longer levers that have advantages. So if you're actually trying to throw a punch, that's why you see boxers, they throw jabs and they keep their arms in close. So they get the rotation about the shoulder, rotation about the elbow, and it comes in quickly. If they go and throw their arm out wide, it's gonna take much longer for the hand to go the same distance if it would have gone in close. So they're gonna be more likely to be blocked, parried, or effectively then to be counter punched because of what they're doing. On the other side, if your goal is to throw a ball as fast as possible, the longer you can get that arm extended appropriately, the better you're gonna have for throwing velocity as opposed to if you just try to short arm and come in tight because you're not going to be able to get as much angular velocity. So, now one thing to keep in mind is our mechanical advantage, which we're gonna find in our body is garbage. And that's simply going to be our re relationship between our resistance to our effort. So we can really just look at our effort arm divided by our resistance arm. It's just a little bit of factoring of the previous formula we were working with. And we're going to find that, like for example, our biceps, because of how tight this is actually going to insert into our form compared to the length 
of our entire arm, we're going to see that in reality, it's looking at being over a 10 to one ratio of disadvantage. So every 10 newtons of force the biceps is lifting through here, that's only gonna allow you to lift one pound through there. So make sure that when you guys are going through your, uh, through your project that you're keeping in mind all of these aspects and really taking in the time to make sure you understand how each of these apply. The same is to be said about these components and how they're gonna be important for movement. And these are the type of things that are gonna come up on your exam. So we're gonna take those Newtonian laws and now we're putting a twist on them again. So objects are going to stay at rest unless they are acted on by an in another force. The amount of acceleration is going to be proportional to the torque that's causing it and vice versa. And when a torque is applied from one body to another, the opposite is, is essentially received by the first. So first we understand is just moment, moment of inertia. And this is going to be the inertia of rotating a body. So this is going to be how much it's going to resist being rotated. Now this is going to be influenced by both the mass of the object and then the length of the diameter or the radius of which that axis is going to be rotated around. Now, for example, if you are to take something like a tennis ball, it's really easy to spin a tennis ball. Now, if you were to go out and try to get like a 500 pound strongman stone and try to spin that, it has a lot more mass and a much bigger radius is gonna be much harder to rotate. So our axis of rotation is going to be effectively the point of which the sum of all of those <coughs> masses and the radius for the center of that mass is gonna be equal to. So for example, in this version, if you had a baseball bat where you put a very heavy weight on the end of the handle where you're holding on, the axis of rotation would actually be really close to the handle. Whereas your typical baseball bat is gonna have an axis of rotation farther or much closer to the barrel. It's effectively, if you were to hold the object up, where is gonna be the point that it would stay balanced? So notice with this pen, it's not actually dead center. It's a little bit more towards the one end as I kick it off my hand. Whereas another object would have a center or moment of inertia that would be at a different location. Now, your radius of gyration is going to be the point of which you're going to find the center of mass relative to its radius when it comes to inertia. So when we're looking at an object, specifically your leg, the way that you can go ahead and decrease the radius of gyration is now to lift your foot close to your butt. So now notice the radius for all of the, from how the distance it is from your hip for your lower leg and for your foot is far shorter than whenever your leg is straight. And this is going to be the reason why athletes are gonna usually bend their knee and lift their toe up whenever they're bringing their foot up in front of themselves whenever they're running or sprinting. Now. Angular momentum is going to be the resistance to that rotation that you're going to have. So, or so it's going to not be the resistance, it's going to be how much rotation you have. So we have our inertia multiplied by, now it's a lowercase omega, that is the, essentially the V for angular velocity. So bigger velocity, bigger inertia, the greater amount of angular momentum. So for example, the planet that we're on, which is round, happens to have a huge amount of angular momentum. Now nowhere near as much as something like Jupiter, but it's got a pretty high amount. Now even if you put a huge amount of spin on a, pin, on a ping pong ball, it still has pretty low angular momentum simply because its inertia due to having a very small mass and very small radius is gonna be very low. So what's really interesting is we're going to have the principle of conservation of angular momentum, which is your angular momentum tends to not really change that much. Yes, you have, especially if we're doing it in a vacuum. Now with air resistance, with friction, otherwise it is going to diminish far faster. But what we're going to see is that once we have an object rotating about an axis, if we can increase or decrease that radius, we're going to in turn decrease or increase that rotational velocity appropriately. So that's why when individuals are doing things like a front flip or a back flip, the tighter of a ball that they get into after they start that initial rotation is going to allow them to rotate at a much higher rate simply because they are having to decrease that radius 
So that initial velocity with that longer radius now becomes much greater. So if we're trying to figure out the initial change in this angular momentum, that's going to be the equivalent to what's known as angular impulse. So think about impulse that we talked about with linear, where it was simply going to be equal to force over time. Now it's going to be torque over time. So we're really looking at the final inertia and rotational velocity minus the initial inertia and rotational velocity. So let's say you and some friends get on a carousel and you, well, one of those old school like merry-go-rounds that you push on a playground. Well, initially it's not moving, but then you guys are going to all start pushing it until you get it up to a certain velocity. And that's going to have been equal to whatever amount of torque you guys all applied on that object and the period of time that you did it over. That's all that angular momentum is. So you're gonna do the same thing of creating it when you're diving off a diving board or if you're a cheerleader doing a vertical or doing a back tuck where you're going to jump up, you're gonna use your arms and otherwise to set to start your initial rotation and then you're gonna tuck your body tightly to allow you to rotate at a much higher speed. So what are we gonna do? All we're doing guys is converting from the one to another. Take your time, pay attention to this because that's really all we're looking at. So what we cared about before was simply mass. Now when it comes to rotational, we're looking at that moment of inertia. When before we really cared about force, well now we're looking at torque. And instead of caring about momentum in a straight line, now we've got angular momentum. And then instead of just straight impulse, we've got angular impulse. It's just adding in the rotational component. That's the key difference. Don't let it freak you out along with the radius. And that's just gonna be from which the object is rotating. Sorry, it just started raining really hard here. So maybe you guys can hear that a little bit in the background. Now, getting back to the Newtonian laws, an object in motion is gonna stay in motion unless something else works upon it. So if we wanna figure out how much an object has accelerated otherwise, well, that's gonna be angular acceleration, and that's gonna be always proportional to our torque. So, and it's gonna be the direction of the torque of which we're producing and inversely proportional. If we wanna figure out, once again, how much torque you had to apply, in order to accelerate a resting carousel from zero degrees per second to 180 degrees per second, well, if we know the initial inertia of the object, so that would be how much it weighs, say it's 100 kilograms and say the radius is one meter, so that's 100 times one squared, which is still one, so we have 100, and we've gone up to 180 degrees, so we can figure out how many seconds it took us to do that, and so it's just simply going to be equal, the torque is going to be equal to 100 divided by, or 100 times 180 degrees, divided by the period of time it took us to get up to that speed, and boom, you've got the torque required to cause the rotation. So now, with that basic understanding, you can literally figure out how hard you need to twist a baseball in order to get it to curve. How hard you need to put a spin on a ping pong ball in order to make it go ahead and rotate and break and move whenever it hits the ground. So all we're looking at, guys, is simply using math to quantify things we've already done. And guys, when you're going through here, listen to this over and over again. Make sure that you understand it. Leave comments, ask questions. We're more than happy to go through this stuff. So for every angular action, there's an equal opposite reaction. One body cannot work on the other without the other one working on itself. So whenever we're producing that torque, well, in order to make that torque happen, it's not like you can just slap the merry-go-round and it's going to move it's pushing against you with the same amount of torque that you're producing. And at the same time, you gotta be able to transmit that through the ground. And that's where we can get into, if we think back to our first questions, issues with friction, where friction cannot be great enough to where you can push it where it matters, like I'm trying to rotate this on ice. You're just gonna be slipping and sliding and the carousel is not gonna rotate at all. So centripetal force is gonna be the force that's going towards the center of whatever it's being rotated against. So think about like the old school, um, amusement parks or otherwise where you would get pinned up against the wall. The greater the velocity that you're going along with the shorter of the radius, the greater amount of centripetal force you're gonna be feeling. Now, the other component we have then is centrifugal force, and that's gonna be the force pulling you away from the center. So if you are, say, swinging a, a rope with the weight on the end around where you're throwing the hammer, that's the force that's trying to pull that weight out of your hand. That's the force that's trying to let that ball go off into whatever direction. And so we're going to always have these two competing forces that are occurring that's going to be perceived by the object causing the rotation and the object being rotated. So thanks for listening.
re-listen to this where you need to, ask questions. It's a lot, guys. Stay safe out there. Have a great day.